You're listening to The Mojo with Steph Renee. Weekdays, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Exclusively on 900 a.m. WURD. Hey, yes, with us on the line is the, you know him from The Ellen Show, of course. Yes. Uh, DJ Tony. Yes. But uh, he is, he's more, much, much more than that. He is an actor and a producer, and he's responsible for the movie that Real Black is bringing to Philadelphia on this Thursday at the African American Museum. Awesome. With us on the line, Tony Akambua. Did I say that correctly? Hi, guys. Hey, Hello, Tony. I know it's early. Please, 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 please properly pronounce your last name for us so that Mike will ever etch it in his memory. Yes, sir. Okay, it's Okumboa. Yeah, Okumboa. Okumboa. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. I know it's early where you are, so we really, really appreciate oh, that's you calling. Okay. I, I, I'm also battling um, allergies, so please. Yeah, forgive me if I sound a tad congested. No problem. Believe me, I understand how that goes. I've got to tell you that I uh, that I watched your, uh, the film Echo Park on Netflix, streaming on Netflix over the weekend, and I was delighted at how you have taken up this role of romantic lead and uh, and, <laughs> and 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 you sell it. Seeing your smile and your flirty <laughs> smile in this particular role was was wonderful for me. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Um, yeah, you know, we just wanted to uh, tell a story. And, you know, I, I, I sort of heard the sort of end of the conversation you, because it's a little early here. I heard a bit of the end of the conversation you were having with the, the, the last gentleman on the phone. Mm-hmm. And um, we, we, we have an approach, which is we, we just want to tell stories where we're just in the picture, in, in lead roles. Yeah. Um, and that's what we tried to do with this one. Indeed. Well, it was a very multicultural, uh, you know, kind of casting and it seems very sort of typical for L.A. and particularly these little enclaves in L.A., uh, you know, where people are living and they're developing. And, and certainly Echo Park businesses and the streets played a prominent role in, in how this film uh, evolves. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Echo Park was definitely a character in the film and obviously the name. But um, Echo Park is no different to major cities, you know, that have these neighborhoods that were once seen as unlivable. And then all of a sudden, gentrification comes in and, you know, there's your Brooklyn's and your Oakland's and your and your Lower East Side in New York at some stage. And so it, it, it happened even in London when I was there. There's parts of it that were just so sort of written off. Yeah. And artists and young people sort of help regenerate and in addition to the people who have been there and weathered the storm. And it's happening in Detroit. So Echo Park is just a splice of what happens in most major cities. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, but going back to the, the diversity of the cast, I mean, there's there's no like you said, there's no emphasis on this being a black, white film or or or. You know how how you say. I mean, it's reflect. It's, I, what I like most about this film is is that it's so forward thinking. It's just an open, uh, just a great story. It's a fun ride. Yeah, yeah. I, and thank you. I really appreciate that. And you know, I think about you know, I personally, and this is just my personal opinion. I believe in telling stories. I think images are incredibly powerful. Mm-hmm. I believe in telling stories where, rather than. For, uh, for want of a better description, hitting someone over the head with this is how it should be and this is us, just happen to be let the, let the president or the CEO of the company or the lead protagonist or the love interest just happen to be a person of color mm-hmm. and yes. go about business. And I think those images are way more powerful to me than, you know, the other images that sometimes studios want to give us is like now we're doing, you know, a black film or something like that. Yeah. Um, I think I think it makes that 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 kind of rhetoric sometimes you sort of can, depending on the material and who's headlining it or, you know, helming it can make an us and them type situation. Well, well, let's let's talk about that. Like, but to, to that end, you've you've taken it within your power to bring these images to the screen. This you produced this film as well as uh, Mother of George and Russell City, two two yeah. films by Andrew Dosimu. You know, how yeah. how did you get like how did you lev- segue from acting over and being on the Ellen Show to making your own films? Well, it was basically by the lack of uh, seeing what I wanted to see on screen, mm-hmm. and so. I had a smidgen, a smidgen being the operative word here, <laughs> of opportunity and sort of connections. 
And we decided, Andrew being a longtime friend, he's like my brother. You know, in Africa, everybody's a brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, we, we came up with some, some stuff and we said, let's make this happen. And my, the rest of the city was our first one. And the thing that I pride myself on with any of these particular pictures, especially the rest of the city and um, Mother of George, is you could interchange the characters with any culture and it would work. So, for instance, in Mother of George, that could have been a Chinese family. That could have been an Iraqi family. That could have been any kind of an immigrant family, and it would work. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the same thing with Restless City. It could have been an Irish young man who moved over here and was in the sort of, you know, trying to find his feet. So I feel that that is the way that I would like to tell stories, you know. And the transition from Ellen and acting is just because I want to be in control um, of, the, of the stories that, uh, that we tell. And, and help people understand a little bit more about your background as well, because, you know, I, I, I love the idea that that everyone in Africa is a brother or a sister. But and, you know, it's, it's for American folks, we get so tied up in our politics, our racial politics, our cultural politics, that uh, understanding how people move in and out of these uh, spaces to tell stories or to be a DJ and all the other things, because uh, obviously you spent considerable time in London. London and, and, you know, it, it help people understand part of your journey. So um, I was, my parents are Nigerian and I speak the language and I was born in England. I speak the language being Yoruba, one of the mm-hmm. languages. Yes. I was born in England and educated in England, Nigeria and New York. So um, born in England, moved to Nigeria, moved back to England moved to New York and then moved to LA. Mm-hmm. And one of one of the things that that afforded me, and I'm incredibly blessed, is the ability to sort of walk in all different worlds. Yeah. Mm. Um, as, 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 not as a spectator, but as a participant. Yes. Um, and that makes a huge difference. And if you've traveled or had the, you know, ability or been blessed to be able to travel in that way as opposed to just going on vacation, you take you know, you take bits from those those places and you become a citizen of the world. Now, in Africa, generally speaking, like you're walking down the street in America and you see an African brother and you sort of raise your head and, you know, that, that nod that we do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, the conversation goes, where are you from? And then you say Nigeria or you say Ghana or you say... Togo or, you know, Sudan. And then it, it, for me, it immediately goes to Sark which is a common thing. And then we, you know, and so there's that camaraderie. So when we, when we see each other, it's like, okay, our experience has some parallel. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the beauties of being a sort of an immigrant in, in America. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you, it translates well into Echo Park because your character, I mean, it's, it, he's a DJ based in, he's living in LA, but he's making, thinking about making the move back over to England. You know, is this, yeah. is this a, a, a story that, how did the script come to you? Was this something that you developed from ground up or was it pre-existing? Yes. I know it came to me based on a bunch of situations that I had experienced, like a, a bunch of characters that I knew. And I, uh, I, I, I looked for a writer and I found an amazing writer called Catalina Astreta, um, Aguela Mastreta. Mm-hmm. And she wrote the screenplay. And then we found the director, Amanda Marsalis, who was a photographer and was mm-hmm. the first feature. And that's how we built the team. But the stories were definitely stories that were very close to me. Like the character... Um, Mateo, who lives across the street, yeah. is my is, is literally in real life one of my dearest friends. Mm. Nice. And he, he he had a similar situation, and I just, and and and, and I, I hope that people see the complexities of what I was trying to do. In that, for a Latino man, who when you see Latino men or African American men on screen or just black men on screen. Mm-hmm. You tend to never see the the tender side, right. the, the, the the vulnerable side. You know that's seen as weakness. That's seen as you know we have to be grah grah grah. Even when they and this is what Mother of George did in the love making scene. We really tried to make these things how we really make love. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing. It's the same thing with Echo Park. 
it, we try to show that we too have. So this guy is fighting for his wife to come back. Yeah. He yes. just wants his wife to come back. And you never see those images on TV of men of color, like in those vulnerable positions. Yeah. yeah. And, and being and being truly a tender father to a young son. Yeah. In, in that way, being able to couple that relationship with the idea of trying to hold your family together. Um, you know, it was it was just beautiful to watch. Yeah. Thank hey, you. Thank you so much. Hey, we're up against a break, but wondering if you could come back and join and, and continue the conversation. Absolutely. All right. Excellent. So we will be back with Tony Okumboa. Uh, as we continue our conversation about Echo Park on today's Real Black Radio. Stay tuned. More beautiful ballads from Stevie Wonder. This one comes to us, uh, uh, you know, from uh, numerous albums before, but was also featured prominently in the film Poetic Justice. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, thinking about the idea of how music also plays a significant character in how uh, the characters of the films come together and the emotional pulse of a film. Music also played a very prominent role in the film Echo Park. And we are speaking to the male lead and producer producer of that film, Tony Okumboa, on the line. This is Stephanie Renee and Mike D back with Real Black Radio. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Hi, guys. Hey, Tony. So, yeah, we're, we've been playing uh, Stevie Wonder music all day. <laughs> yes. I, I love Stevie Wonder. Indeed. Well, well, talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, the fact that you borrowed from your life as a DJ in the film. And uh, it turns out that, you know, without spoiling the the storyline for people, that uh, sort of the exchange of music and perception of music also played a secondary role in the relationship. And how timely was that, right? Yeah. In terms of our, our, our recent loss. Yes. Um, you know, um, yeah, I, I feel like music is a part of who I am. And, Ed, and in, given the opportunity, any story I tell, I will throw music in where, any which way but lose. <laughs> and and the, the, the fact that um, the soundtrack, I, I, I don't know if you know how that came to be, we, I mean, we, we, it was a small budget film, and we, you know, nowadays a lot of these artists, rightly so or wrongly so, are asking for a lot of money to put their music in films. Yeah, and we couldn't, aff- and we couldn't afford it. So I reached out to on social media to unsigned artists. I said, "Listen, if you are interested in having your music be showcased in a film, that could, you know, give you some, you know, kind of." A bump or jump or visibility, you know, send me your music and we'll, if it's appropriate, we'll put it in the film. And that's how I got most of the music for the film. Nice. And one of the compliments we get is about the soundtrack. Yes. Um, people keep asking us, is there a soundtrack? Is there a soundtrack? So what we've started, we're trying to, we're working on that at the moment, but we're in the, in the meantime, we're introducing these artists to our audience. We, on our Facebook page, there's a list of all the artists and some of their links to their music. And people have actually written in and said, listen, I had fun shazamming the music through the film and discovering all these new artists. It's mm-hmm. been, you know, And I'm like, wow, that's really amazing. So hopefully it's a win-win situation for all of us. Yes. Fantastic. And, and talk about the distribution. This is your second release with Array. Uh, how important in terms of the movement and getting these types of new images or diverse images out there is... Well, Array, array I guess got to tell you, Array is family. It's just not like work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Ava, Tulane, and Mercedes, those are like my sisters, you know. I, I'm, I'm really... Um, I'm really blessed to have, have met them and have worked with them a few times and become friends with them. And... I, to be honest with you, I thought about this. I don't think there's anybody out there like them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely there, not. There, there truly isn't. Um, what they're doing is going to become the model for distribution. Put it this way. As an independent filmmaker who made a small film that might not appeal to the mainstream when, I, when we made Restless City for it, we had nowhere to go per se except for you know, maybe straight to digital demand. Mm-hmm. What uh, what Array was able to do for us was we premiered in major cities theatrically. That's unheard of. Right. 
and we were able to get on major distribution platforms digitally. Now, you have to, you have to understand what I'm saying when I say this. There are a lot of new digi- digital distribution platforms from YouTube to Vimeo. And to be honest with you, they're growing. So if you're a small film and you get on one of those platforms, people might never see you. Mm-hmm. Never. We, through Array, through Ava, Tulane, and Mercedes, were put on platforms that the world goes to to look for films. Mm-hmm. That's huge. Yeah. Netflix. It, Netflix is a studio unto itself. Yes. And so you go on Netflix and our film comes up on a recommendation page right in front of you. The amount of people who have said, and that's no small feat, because there are thousands of films on Netflix. You know, so those yeah. girls are, are, are they're, 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 they're doing incredible work, and I'm so blessed to know them and to be working with them a second time, and I think they're going to go from strength to strength. Yeah, and you know, for you know, you can go right now, mm-hmm. right in this very second, and go to Netflix and watch Echo Park. Yes, but we want people yeah. to also come Thursday night at the African American yes. Museum. Yes, and experience it, and experience, and experience it, it with a group, and experience okay. it on a bigger screen, so, and, and you know, all the things that go but, along with the communal nature of film watching. Yeah, well, it's just making it available yeah. in any any way that you like to digest films. Array is able to to give it to you. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, but I will say this much. I, I will say this much. Seeing a film on a big screen with the Dolby surround sound is a, is a different experience. It and is. If that opportunity, if that opportunity, now we can't compete with that because these movies coming out are, third, are like three, 2,000, you know, um, screens that they need to make. So whenever you can see a, a film by an independent filmmaker on a big screen, I would run, not walk to see it because it's such an experience. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I, I laugh at the idea of, uh, you know, the idea of building family. I love the fact that when you refer to this uh, filmmaking experience for you, that these people uh, that you have put as a part of your network or that you consider to be a part of your network all feel like family to you. And I think that makes a huge difference in uh, the the way that the experience unfolds for both you and the audience, because I think a lot of people in the array film watching experience feel like they're being welcomed into the theater as family and and it really makes a profound difference in how they speak about these films and generate that word of mouth buzz that makes these films successful oh my gosh the, the rebels they call they call the array rebels yes mm-hmm. they they talk about this film like they made it which is what you which is what you pray for when you hand your film over to anybody you, pr- I mean, they, re- and, and that's the beauty of family, and that's the beauty of t- true family, not just in words. You know, like you know, like as they say, that's my ride or die. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that person has my back, and the the amount of support that we get is just so incredible. And they have created an amazing network of these passionate, driven, intelligent, smart amazing people who have a passion for what the array is doing and they and they buy into it and it's such an amazing feeling absolutely and people can go to array.com to find out more about becoming supporting array yes. and becoming yeah. a rebel and if you want to volunteer at events you can become a maverick mm-hmm. and their perks yeah. for that Ma- oh, they, they choose we choose one maverick a year to go to sundance which is where i met Am- amanda marsalis mm-hmm. you know so what what's it like working with amanda i mean she's she's giving you some beautiful images and yeah. uh, and you have some really well, sensitive the, performances one of the amazing amazing things about that was we needed someone who would make it look beautiful because a story is a story and performances will help and everything else. But the way you photograph it is also very, very important. Indeed. That will let it stand out. And Amanda was, you know, someone that once we saw her work, we were like, wow, she's definitely got a a beautiful, uh, a beautiful, a a good eye that can bring out these, these things we're trying to do. Couple that with our DP, who is a guy called, um, Jason McCormick, who was also incredibly instrumental in putting it together, and then the ta- the, t- the cast of Maurice and Gail and Mamie Gummer, um, you know, we were able to put it together as a as a, as a team, and and we were we're very happy with what we came out. 
Absolutely. No, it's a beautiful film. You did an amazing job. Thank you. you know, so Thank you so much. What's, what's next for Tony? Are you making more? I'm sure you're making more films. And where can people oh, find you? Yes. Yeah, well, um, at the moment, you can find me uh, on, on social media. That's at Tony... At, sorry, what's my social... My Instagram is at T-O-K-U-N-G-B-O-W-A. Uh, T-O that's T-O-K-U-N-G-B-O-W-A. And my Twitter is at Tony O-K. And um, you can also find me on Facebook. Um, we're developing a bunch of stuff. Um, you know you know how it is in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. We're developing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but needless to say... Uh, it's along the lines of what we spoke about. They're going to be stories that are just un- u- regular people in unusual circumstances who happen to be of color. Yeah. That's it. Fantastic. Well, we need so, so much more course. of that in the world. And we're glad yeah. that you're helping to captain uh, you know, one of the many ships that seem to be sailing in that direction. Amen. Uh, so we Amen. thank you. We, that. we thank you so much for your time on the air today. And, and again, as you refer to everyone as family, I jokingly say uh, around here, I've been doing uh, family research and DNA testing and everything. And I happen to be just about half Nigerian in my DNA. So I will consider I you a cousin. It. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I just felt it in my bones. <laughs> so we will we will continue that family network and trend. Please keep us Absolutely. informed about your ne- your upcoming releases. We'd love to have you back on and continue to encourage people to support your work. Thank you so much. And as we say in Nigeria, God bless you, and I will see you soon, my sister. Indeed. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to you look. too. Again, that's Tony Okumboa, ladies and gentlemen, and the film is Echo Park. Please remind folks, Mike, about how they can see it here locally. It's playing this Thursday, 7 p.m. at the African American Museum in Philadelphia, which is at 7th and Arch. Uh, tickets are ranging from 7 to $13. Okay. And we'd love to see your face in the place. You've been listening to The Mojo with Steph Renee. Weekdays, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Exclusively on 900 a.m. WURD.